guess some of you may remember that almost one year ago, a group of 33 miners were trapped 700 meters below the ground. They had to wait for 70 days for being rescued. Meanwhile, they managed to get in contact with their rescue team and with their families. Sometimes I have the feeling that educational institutions are also trapped 700 meters below the ground with very little communication with the outside world. Today, I would like to discuss, to share with you some thoughts about how certain edu institutions are embedding the technology in the classrooms. And I would like to analyze that from the perspective of the literacy. To do that, I'm going to provide three basic statements, and I'll be inspired in these ideas of Marshall McLuhan, who said that we drive into the future only using our rear view mirror. If I don't say something smart, you don't have to tweet it, please. The first statement suggests that the way that we have been embedding the technology in the classroom has been quite linear, quite predictable, quite unflexible, and if you allow me, I would say boring. Let's start with this one. Hi, Mia Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University. I'd like to discuss... In the late 50s, Frederick Skinner, professor from the University of Oxford, Harvard, designed this teaching machine, which honestly looks like a toaster, as you can see. <laughs> but he was saying that with this machine, kids will be absolutely exciting to learn. So they had to fulfill in this small blanket and answering the questions. So he was saying that kids will be particularly engaged with the learning process. And I don't know you, but I see those kids quite boring there. So again, Maybe you may say, okay, but this is too old. Now we have better technologies. So I invite you to jump to the future. Let's go to jump 45 years or so. <coughs> then I had the luck to go to the university in the early years of the internet as we know it. Meanwhile, Al Gore was announcing that the super highway of information will come to our world. So. Do you still remember that noise? <laughs> Wasn't it terrible? The bad news is the way that we were using technologies was also so quite boring. I know it's true, the search engines were slow, the websites are quite, they were quite plain and gray, but also the way that teachers were teaching the education was always predictable, fulfilling the blanks and do it using the technologies in a quite predictable way. Okay, the noise was terrible, so you may say, this is too old. So why don't we jump to the future again? Let's go to the future. To the future. So we are in the future now. Right, so we are in the future now. And this future is saying that we need to bring laptops. Negro Ponte was suggesting to bring laptops. The bad news is now he's saying that we have to bring tablets. So let's get rid of the, ta the laptops and let's use the tablet now, but because this is the coolest thing. So now we have this, this strange combination of all buildings with all ways of teaching, with all ways of providing the, uh, all ways of assess the knowledge with very modern technologies. This is a sort of postmodern school, I would say. But to be honest, we don't have to kill the messenger. Negroponte is a researcher and a very well-known one. But the thing is, the problem is if we think just only bringing, Negro, bringing laptops in the classroom, the magic will happen. So I quite think that we have to think a bit deeper in literacies. And this has to do with my second basic statement. We are in this transition time where we have the traditional literacies, which has been broadly used, broadly understood as the know how to read and write, particularly in those who are over 15 years old in order to make, to make global measures, and the new literacies that the 21st century world demand. So we have this nice overlapping, but sometimes I have the feeling that educational institutions are quite illiterate in this sense. So meanwhile, I'm going to offer you a snapshot where we travel from the 20th to the 21st century. Please enjoy this mobile learning machine used in the 50s in the rural areas of China. So 
I guess you remember that at the beginning of this year, during the Arab Spring, President Mubarak decided to shut down the internet. And it was a massive concern because it was affecting the democracy and it was a, a major problem, not all, only for Egypt, but, but for many other countries. I have the feeling that sometimes we have President Mubarak in many classrooms in the world who are suggesting to block the internet because that could be dangerous for the kids. Certain information could empower them in a nasty way. Now, if we take a look backward again, and we go to the beginning of the 20th century, we can see this chart provided by Matthew White. He was painting in orange and red where, where the highest levels of illiteracy. Please keep in mind this picture because, again, I'm going to bring you to the future. This is how the United Nations envisioned the traditional illiteracy in 2015. As you can see, the illiteracy has been squeezed just in the north of Africa and in the south of Asia. Let's be fair, I think this is a good news. We have been reducing the traditional literacy in such a good way, particularly from the 70s to now. But something has been happening between. This chart was shown a while ago, but I thought it was interesting to bring it. International Tele Telecommunication Union made this graph, this chart, to uh, represent how the internet has been evolving, and even more, even faster, the mobile technologies. So obviously, the eruption of these new devices demand us to develop new literacies. So, for a long while, I would say since the mid of the 90s to now, we have been discussing this so-called digital divide. And we are, we, we are still way ahead of what, where we should be. Only two every seven human beings have access to the internet. But the bad news is this is not the only problem that we have. There are other problems that we have to care. This picture, which I think is pretty cool, was made by Lloyd and Martin. And these guys decide to map Geotag in the world where articles were generated to publish on Wikipedia. More than 400,000 articles. And you can see that those articles are basically created in certain areas of the world. My friend Mark Graham from the Oxford Internet Institute identified that 84% of the articles published on Wikipedia are coming from the US and the EU. And even more, there are more articles about Antarctica than articles of a particular country in South America or Africa. Isn't it amazing? This is the other me massive literacy that we have to care for. So there are certain gaps. Well, there are a lot of gaps, actually, but I would like to focus on just a few of them. Gaps in the literacy to know how to create valuable content. Certain gaps that we have to fulfill in terms of how we can better understand the translation of knowledge, and particularly how can we foster the sharing of knowledge. So let me stop here for a second. We know that it's quite important to understand the, the value and was very well explained a minute ago by Mario. The need to create and recreate and combine and recombine useful pieces of knowledge. What is the problem? that sometimes our educators are quite concerned that the kids or even the students from the higher uh, education institutions are using the Wikipedia and other contents on, online that are maybe not as good as they would like to. I think it's quite difficult to change the world where we're living on. And it's quite evident as well that science has been always evolving in this way. So instead of Instead of less, we, what we need is less copyright and more right to copy. This is one of the literacy that we need to embed, I guess. The second one has to do with this capability to translate knowledge. Now, in the translation of knowledge, there are many ways to understand it, but I, I feel quite comfortable with uh, Paulo Freire's idea from the late 60s when he was saying that we have to get rid of this student as a recipient of content and we have to move forward to understand the student as a connector, a person that is able to connect different knowledge and to translate those knowledge to different contexts, but also to the different, different formats, right? Not only from analog to digital, but for different people and rebuilding those knowledge based on this literacy and the previous one that I previously mentioned. And also, the value of sharing. Technologies are allowing us to share the contents in a cheaper way and in a faster way. So we have this whole list of 
what we can call the smart internet, right? Khan was giving an explanation quite well now. But there's this whole internet. What is the problem that I see? That our educators, many of them, are quite concerned that someone can steal their PowerPoints because they're super useful. And our learning platforms are all protected by many passwords with many capitals and fonts weird because are concerned that someone can steal these learning contents, which I think is affecting this possibility to share, which is something that we know that can push and foster creativity. So there's no magic clue here. There's no recipe to follow. But I, I'm going to suggest a third and last statement. This statement suggests that we have to find a triangle, a triology, let's say. We need the contents. Of course that we need the contents. We need to combine those contents with containers, the platforms that we have been discussing broadly today. OK, that part is super relevant. But this is a technical innovation. This is one bit of the effort that we have to make. We have the other part, which is the context. And I think it has to do with the social innovation. We call it invisible learning. You may call it as you want. The problem is not the name. The problem is sometimes the discussion is so focused in their part. So what I'm going to share with you is an experience that we thought and I thought that could be inspiring, at least was inspiring, inspiring for us, and is embracing this idea of understanding the learning in a 360 degrees. In the slums, also known, known as favelas of Rio de Janeiro, in the 1995, a group of entrepreneurs decided to build this so-called Committee for Democracy in Information Technology. And they had an amazing idea. They decided to use the technologies as an excuse to help kids who were under social risk. But not only kids, physically and mentally disabled people, former prisoners, and indigenous people. And what I'm going to show you now are some of the flavors that we took from that experience. And I really think that formal education institutions, doesn't matter the level, may learn a few things from them. The first one has to do with this idea that they understood the real value of create bridges between the formal education and the informal education. How to do that? Well, the way that they see it is creating IT projects that are meaningful and relevant for their communities. So for example, here what they do is they take all pieces of technology and they rebuild them and create new softwares and new hardwares. So it's not just a recycle program, but also is fostering the creativity and innovation. This is one thing. The other thing that I thought was interesting from them is they understood the value of create experimental communities. Experimental communities where they highlight the value of trial error, trial error continuously, problem-based learning, and this idea of take the classroom outside, bring the classroom outside the world. Because that allows al allow them to combine very, very different disciplines. And the other flavor that I saw in that experience, which I thought, I thought was interesting to share with you, is this idea that has been broadly discussed today, the peer-based learning. So as Sugarta Mirtra suggests, it doesn't really matter if the IT teacher, teacher is not great, because we can foster this micro-transference that we have daily. Micro-transference between your colleagues, between your partners, between your brothers. Micro, because it's not something very formal, could be particularly tacit based on observation, right? And I felt that that could be something to keep in mind. So less relevance to the educator and more relevance to the sharing of knowledge. That is something that also has been quietly discussed today. And the, f the final aspect that I'm really, I'm really excited with it, and I still believe that higher education is quite behind that, is this idea of the lifelong learning. And lifelong learning has to do not only with learn during all your life, but Understand that the learning cannot have constraints in terms of space, in terms of time, particularly in terms of age, right? Now, this has to do, of course, with this idea of do it yourself, but also, I think, recover this idea suggested by John Moravec that rather than only focus on what we learn, let's focus on how we learn. And the Princeton University has this creative center for leadership. We suggest that we learn in a 70-20-10 combination. What is that? They suggest that we learn 70% based on experience or our work, 
20% based on what we learn from our partners, our colleagues, our mates, and 10% based on formal education. I think it's interesting that these data are coming from a really well-known institution. So, rather than the number, I would like to keep you, share with you this, at least a trend that we have to consider. So, let me be clear. I'm not against technology. Actually, I'm really happy that the United Nations only 44 days ago published that the access to human right, access to internet has to be a human right. Um, I think this is an outstanding news. But after that, we have been investing this massive interest in the technologies. I think it's time to bring back this basic question, which is how can we provide this right, this access to an education that is able to answer the challenge of our times, that is able to foster the development of new literacies, that is able to foster the development of those skills which are relevant for this knowledge-based society. If we are able to do that, I'm pretty sure that we will reduce the distance, this massive distance between the classroom and the outside world. Thank you very much.